Well, hi, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here in Canada's fairest city. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it is true that I prepared myself for this lecture by having three bowls of porridge yesterday morning. Andrew Morris was quite correct in that observation. Uh, but to get back at Andrew, uh, we are going to be putting on our website photos of Andrew uh, at the Scottish Country Dancing a few conferences ago. And if you look carefully, you will no find out, you will find out what a Scotsman wears under his kilt. Um, this talk is really uh, an outgrowth of being asked to speak to the International Union of Health Promotion and Education, a meeting I don't usually attend, in, uh, near Bangkok last summer. And uh, they asked me to address this question uh, in the global context. So I used a lot of slides from the Millennium Development Goals. And I was going to do that here. But of course, for this meeting, I've added observations throughout the talk uh, about record linkage and what it could do to help us assess the degree to which any country has achieved uh, health equity throughout the life course. So that's how this talk is structured. Uh, but then I realized that having spent some of my life working in Tanzania and having been back and visited a few times in the last decade, talking about record linkage in a context like that is still pie in the sky. There are no records to link. Or if there are records, they're not very good. If you don't count births and deaths very well, you don't probably have much interest in linking. So I thought, well, why don't I just take two countries that I am now in the process of comparing around these seven best societal investments for health equity through the life course. And those two countries are Scotland and the UK as a whole, which is, of course, problematic since Scotland's included in the UK, at least it is until September 18th when the referendum happens. Uh, so sometimes I've got the segregated England and Wales data to compare to Scotland. And sometimes uh, I have to just show you UK data, which of course understates the differences since it includes the Scottish differences. So let's get started. So the first investment. Now, so you're going to say to me, where did I get these investments from? Hey, I thought them up. I'm a really, I'm a really old dog now. And uh, I've been writing about uh, the determinants of uh, social gradients and their um, mitigation for 25 years. So, um, and some of that was with Clyde. And uh, so I made them up. So if you don't like them, you can use Michael Marmot's report. If you think these are vague and, and utopian, you should read his report. And I, I think he's the most amazing guy in the world. I've got nothing but praise for him. But unfortunately, his report just reads like a socialist manifesto, and that's what the Tories thought of it. So, the first investment that any government has to make in the life course is universally accessible, and for that, it has to be free. Uh, Canadians got that. They got that figured out. Americans, still confused. Universally accessible, for that is free, strongly promoted, and high-quality family planning, pre- and perinatal care, including effective breastfeeding promotion and support. So I'm going to show you about four data slides now. To summarize, Scotland has achieved world-class levels of early life mortality. I'm going to focus on infant mortality simply because that's the one outcome for which I found precisely comparable computations for England and Wales and for Scotland. This is one of the problems with gradual devolution. Uh, Ronan knows about this. The farther you see devolution proceed in the United Kingdom, the harder it is to get truly comparable data on almost any outcome for two jurisdictions. Um, however, Scotland lags behind on its uh, socioeconomic status inequalities, breastfeeding rates, and the drivers of low birth weight, especially prematurity, with one important positive exception, which we'll give Scotland real credit for. I'll show you that. So if we just look at neonatal deaths, um, Scotland in, in green, United Kingdom in uh, red, so this understates the actual difference between England and Wales and Scotland again. We see that from 1970 to 2010, we get this uh, really all, pretty much exponential decline with the plateauing, which is true of all developed countries. Uh, and we're now at the level in the last five or 10 years uh, where further major declines are not likely. Uh, and this is to do with the great burden of uh, prematurity, which I'm going to come on to in more detail. But also, there are some deaths from intrauterine effects, uh, placental effects, 
there are inter there are postpartum events related to complex obstetrical complications. That is, and there are also, of course, uh, congenital malformations. So there's a kind of a biological wall down there uh, for this outcome, and not many countries have got below three. And what you see here is that Scotland is <laughs> down below three. This is the only health outcome, to my knowledge, in which Scotland is clearly at world-class level and has thumped uh, England and Wales in the last decade and a half, and no one has a clue why. No one. Uh, the best shot I've heard about it, the best guess I've heard from a, a very thoughtful Scottish epidemiologist, um, Jim Chalmers, is that Scotland only has about two to more recently four percent of its population not born in the UK. And it's still pretty white. Many of the newer immigrants are from Eastern Europe. Uh, they're there to make money and now many of them are staying. And so the midwives of Scotland, the second language they're learning is Polish. And those people, uh, they have very, very low rates and I'll show you in a minute something about breastfeeding as well, which is probably also the improvements are related to their arrival on the scene. Um, but one of the consequences of not having certain immigrant groups in any numbers is that certain issues don't arise as they do in England and Wales. And one of those is, has been mentioned already at this conference and is consanguinity, which is the tendency for some ethnic groups to preferentially marry first cousins. Um, and there is a burden of, uh, particularly of, of problems like neural tube defects that, that relate to, to consanguinity. So you might say, oh yeah, but you surely folate. They got folate in the flour, don't they? No, no, there's, there's no folate in the flour or any other food of the United Kingdom because the United Kingdom has no politicians who want to deal with the electorate around the adulteration of food. For the same reason, which I'm more sympathetic to, uh, they don't want GM in the food chain, genetically modified crops. They don't want any folate in their food. They don't want any vitamin D in their milk. They don't want any of that stuff. So they don't have any of it, and lots of people are deficient in both. Uh, so this is a good news story, but I haven't shown you anything but the overall average. I haven't shown you the, the socioeconomic differences in the two countries. This is post-neonatal, same pattern. Maybe same reasons, I'm not sure. So the first graph is um, from, you have to imagine, to find comparable data, you have to go to the Poverty UK website. Not the health website, the Poverty website. It's an NGO, very good one. And they've computed using um, uh, the Registrar General social classes one to four, and social classes five to eight. This is a newer system than the old system, which was Roman numerals. Uh, so we have, of course, in, in the uh, purple, we have the uh, rates, the infant mortality rates every year from 99 to 2009, 11 year series, for the, uh, the bottom half of the social ladder, if you like, um, which is this line here. This is uh, England and Wales, of course, so it's pretty smooth because not a lot of stochastic variation at that sample size, um, 500,000 births a year or something like it. And, uh, and this is for the, the wealthiest. And of course, they've both been coming down. Actually, the poorest have been coming down a little faster in absolute terms, and so the gap is narrowed, which is great, but they're still quite a ways apart. But they're not nearly as far apart as Scotland's exact same social classes. So this is Scottish data. It does bounce around, so you have to draw a best line, a fit line, but without getting into detail, if we take off the far left where they use the old system of social classes, and we just compare what, you'll, what you'd find if you put the two graphs together, and it's too busy a slide to do that, but I'll tell you what you find. You find that the poorest folks in Scotland with this infant mortality, which is really almost like a middle-income country, sitting at 2001 at around 7.5 per thousand babies, uh, born live births, um, and down here 2009, it's come down, thankfully, to 5.5 or so. But it still remains higher on all years than the English and those incredibly sophisticated Scots, of whom there are several in the room, who are at the top of the ladder, they have the lowest rates in Western Europe. Very few countries have rates that low. Iceland, Holland, a few places, a few Nordic countries, Japan. So uh, there's, there's a gap that has not, um, not been, it's coming down, but it's still there and it's still bigger than, than the other country. So we'll, what about the main driver of this, which is prematurity and small for gestational age combining? Both, of course, gives you low birth weight. And uh, I've got to be careful what I say here because Fiona wrote the book on this. Uh, so I know she'll catch me if I make any epidemiological errors. Well, 
Oh, well, first I've got to show you an underlying driver, more important than that. And this is a, this is a driver of, of not only infant mortality, but of, of big differences in intellectual development. In fact, a new paper uh, by Amanda Sacker and others at, uh, in London has shown that in the last two British birth cohorts, 58 and 70, uh, when breastfeeding is properly measured, it uh, changed the upward and downward social mobility of the children massively. <laughs> increased their upward mobility and reduced their downward mobility in terms of intergenerational mobility. And it, it did so through what appeared to be neurological me mechanisms, which they had proxies for, and they controlled for every confounder you can think of. They had very detailed data. So besides all the other good things about it, well, what this shows, this is the, this is the rates of breastfeeding in the five quintiles of Scotland's index of multiple deprivation for all addresses, home addresses. So, there's a, this is based upon very finely grained data zones, 6,505 of them for 5 million people in Scotland. So each data zone is less than 1,000 people in it, and they, the data zones are respecting of natural community boundaries such as social housing, the housing estate boundaries. So they, they're meaningful. They're meaningful communities and sub-communities. And what you see is, with the exception of the bottom one, which is the breast, this is any breastfeeding when the health visitor goes at six to eight weeks, so the, the, the folks at the bottom, pardon me, folks at the bottom who are the, the poorest, fifth of Scots, we have this incredible 15, 18, maybe now 20%. So it's come up a bit. And the others are dead flat with basically they're 10 percentage points apart. So they are the lowest in Western Europe as far as we know. Not, not, the, not the privileged Scots who live in Bears Den in Glasgow and Newtown in Edinburgh. And this is a peculiar combination of Scottish culture and something to do with the body, something to do with the long reach of Calvinism. My, my wife is a professional lactation um, trainer of women uh, and uh, counselor. She does the hotline for all of the UK a couple times a week. And there is something definitely about bre the breast for, for, some, for many Scottish women, particularly if who have less education, because they do, they do tend to think of it as yucky. And there's also a little problem with, I think, the influence of the spouse and the way they think the spouse uh, will see their breasts in the future, which is, of course, a damn shame, really. Uh, in Africa, you know, the breast isn't a sexual object at all. The thigh, that's a big deal. But the breast is just totally functional infant feeding mechanism. So, so this, is, this is in spite of a lot of government campaigns, but they're of the sort that in involve posters in the bus shelter. Now, I don't know about you, but let's say I was a 17-year-old mom to be. I don't think I would change my views about breastfeeding because I saw a good poster in the bus shelter. I don't know about you, but I think it's a very personal decision. And I think we got to stop doing that bus shelter poster thing. <laughs> now, let's get real. People need to have an intimate conversations with a trusted advisor, and they have to do that, in Scotland's case, when they're in their mid-teens again and again and again through a better system in the schools of physical self, sex and um, life, they call it now, education. So we got a problem there and it's driving a big difference. Um, now, if you combine small for gestational age and, uh, low, and prematurity, you get low birth weight. Both, for, both causes, unfortunately, are, are lumped. And that's how Scotland's been monitoring inequalities by health inequalities. I've urged them to separate them, and they're going to start to do that. They're trying to get the, the stational edge from ultrasound to be machine readable in the records, and I think they'll soon have it. But what you see here is uh, an astonishing time series, one of 12 health outcomes. I'm not going to show you the rest because I, I did that talk when I was here last year for UBC. Um, this is the only one I'm going to show you from a report that comes out annually, and it's, it's set up by taking the entire population but there's no linkage involved. You're wondering, when am I going to get to linkage, aren't you? I know you are. Patience, patience. Um, this, this is all of the low birth weight babies in all of the babies born each year for, I don't know, 14 years in Scotland in a row, 98 to 2011 provisional data. And the pink line at the bottom is the rate of low birth weight babies for the wealthiest and most educated 10% of women by their postcode index of multiple deprivation. And the line at the top is the poorest 10% of postcodes. And they look, again, they look like the best countries in the world. Iceland, you know, you heard me go through this before around infant mortality. It's the same list. Holland, Nordic countries, Japan. And the top one looks a bit like Harlem in New York City. So it's two worlds. 
two completely different worlds. And furthermore, recent reviews suggest that the main driver of this outcome, which in modern developed societies is prematurity rather than small fruit gestational age, is going to be virtually impossible to, to improve because of two things. You can read the great review by Hannah Cheng and her colleagues in The Lancet in January of 13. First of all, science doesn't know how to prevent prematurity because we don't know the causes. So when you go to your local town planning meeting and people start to say they want to reduce prematurity and a lot of public health people just, they just didn't get much training. They're good people and they have great values, but they didn't get much training in thinking about health targets. Don't ever set that target because you have no hope. Cheng et al. found that the most you could expect to reduce prematurity on the basis of implementing all that we currently know about it is a 5% reduction. And to get that, you'd have to ratchet down iatrogenic prematurity from two early inductions and labors. Induction of labor just before 37. Either they got the dates wrong or somebody was impatient, had a golf game, got to get to that, whatever. Talking about the obstetrician, not the mom probably. Um, and uh, so we recently had a great study in, um, in Scotland by Jill Pell and her colleagues who showed that most of the special needs children, in, uh, a great fraction of them in, uh, in the school system, were born just before 37 weeks because of these sorts of practices, you know, 25% Caesar rates. Um, because there's a certain error, right? And some of the kids aren't going to truly be 37 weeks. And it turns out they have just enough difference in neural development that they actually contribute, just as we heard earlier about another disease, that famous Jeffrey Rose idea, uh, that the bulk of the cases come from those at small risk. In this case, they were at small risk. They weren't like the 32-weekers or the 30-weekers, but the numbers are so massive that they actually contribute to the burden at the population level of special needs. So what happened here, 2006, something, a miracle happened. It's like they, there was nobody nobody knowing that they were going to achieve this. There was no target. They, they, they weren't expecting to get any improvements in this. I've already told you how hard it is to reduce it. Well, it turns out that when they banned smoking a year ahead of England, and a year behind, or two, Scotland, I think, Ronan, isn't that right? Um, it turned out from a very exquisitely skillful time series analysis by Jill Pelligan and her colleagues, Danny McKay in, in Glasgow, that the long-term time trend, this happens to be premature births, so they separated prematures, the long-term time trend upwards, which is going on most of the Western world for mostly this reason I gave you. By the way, there's also legitimate medical induction and scissors for babies that are failing to thrive in utero, placental dysfunction. And those are legitimate and the baby's better off. I'm not talking about those. That's not the big driver here. It is a small driver of increasing prematurity. The smoking ban reduced premature births over, almost overnight by 11%. And to my knowledge, and I'm sure Fiona or somebody here will correct me if I'm wrong, this was not a known effect. It wasn't known that secondhand smoke is a precipitant of labor. Because the time, the time frame here of the change is too rapid for it to be anything else. It also reduced small for gestational age, but we'd, we'd expect that, and that takes a little longer. So that's great, except there's no second act. So now they've set a target. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't give them the right advice on this. I got upset when they set the target instead of, uh, you know, instead of bar bargaining with them. They set a target of 15% reduction in low birth weight in the next two years. And uh, the world's experts say the most they could get is 5%, so clearly somebody's gonna be disappointed. So be careful when you set targets. Now, I've implied this, so I, I, I need to say it though. This is, it's great to have all these ecologically assigned social economic status measures in Scotland at a finely graded, fine grained geographic uh, approach. But it's not the same as individual level covariates and it's not ever going to be the same. It captures everything about the neighborhood that's deprived. So as I showed in our uh, little paper I presented in Perth at this conference, um, it actually gives you a bigger effect size if you use these little data zones rank ordered by index of multiple deprivation then it, get, then it will give you an effect size around any single or two individual level SES factors like education or income because it captures all the things about a Scottish deprived housing estate and typically which contribute to ill health. But if you really wanted to do this right, you do what some Canadian centers and some Australian centers are now starting to do, you'd have a series of outcomes. I mean, let's face it, infant mortality, while terrible and tragic, is now too rare an outcome to be of great public health interest. It's bouncing down around four per thousand 
What about the 996? All kinds of things are happening with them. Not, it's not all good, as we heard uh, in Fiona's talk. So we need to stop focusing on the graveyard and move upstream. Topic of a different talk I do. And in this case, we need not only the EDI school entry, but we need other measures, which I know uh, are under development. HELP has been working on a measure in toddlerhood and one for later childhood, and other people around the world are working on them. They have to be measures that a health visitor or community nurse can put in place. Because of course, the great brilliant thing about the EDI is the kids are all in school and there's a teacher, and when they, she or he knows the kids well enough, they just fill out the whole questionnaire, all 104 items from memory, and they enjoy it. Um, but not so easy, you want to reach, get high coverage of toddlers, and that's not so easy. In Scotland, they're not all in preschool, so we'll come back to that in a minute. So, um, if we think about what we'd like to have in an early life population level data set, we're, all, we're going to have to get it by linkage. Uh, and it's great to have child cohorts. We have one that's pretty good in Scotland, three sub-birth cohorts called Growing Up in Scotland. But it, it only has limited power for all kinds of questions. And it has some volunteer bias in its enrollment, which is inevitable. So it's not so easy. And then it has some attrition, which is impossible to fully correct for, as I think most of us agree. So we need to think hard about how to build that. And Ronan and I are going to be thinking about that for a panel in a few weeks' time in, in Edinburgh with Ruth Gilbert from, from London, who's, of course, a terrific researcher on looked-after children, among other things. So I'm just going to show you one slide about the EDI, because uh, it, Claude talked me into trying the EDI in Scotland. It's extremely striking that nobody in the UK uses the EDI. Um, in fact, very few countries in Europe use the EDI. I think I'm right in that. And there are a few pilots here and there, but there was none. And as far as I could tell, we haven't found anybody in, in, in England. So uh, we piloted it in a little area east of uh, Edinburgh called East Lothian. It's very pretty along the Firth of Forth south coast there. It's not a poor area, so we're a little short on the sample size for the folks in the bottom quintile of the Scottish Index and also deprivation. They just don't live in East Lothian. But what we found was just what Clyde would have hoped. He didn't live to see these results, which is it performs exactly the same way there as it does in Canada and Australia and every other place it's been used. You get this great gradient where we have at the bottom the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation Quintile of the parent's postcode by those little data zones I told you about. And the overall vulnerability, that's kids in the bottom 10% of scores for the overall sample. We had no national sample, so these are the overall East Lothian 1,200 kids we did in P1, first year primary, around age five to six. Uh, the poorest quintile had 38.5%, almost the same. Well, that's a very small sample size, as I told you, for the poorest. So that's got a wide confidence interval. About the same for the second quintile. And it drops down to 16.7%. And what Clyde would say, if he were here, is he would say, Ah, well, that's very good because that means the government can't find out what the pattern is without collecting the EDI data because it's not completely collinear with social class. It, it's the case that in, in the poorest quintile, five-eighths of the kids are not vulnerable. And in the richest quintile, one-sixth of the kids are vulnerable. So just using the index of multiple deprivation, which Scotland's had to make decisions with for a long time to, say, allocate preschool resources, will not get it right. And in fact, in our data, when we did the little maps and we showed the local people, we gave them the maps and the data at the school level. There were six school clusters, and one of the school clusters was way worse than they expected. It wasn't the poorest part of, of the community at all. So we said, what's going on? And they said, oh yeah, that's right. They opened a housing estate there about six or seven years ago. Public housing estate, people that move in, just have time, have a baby. Baby's now five or six. So. These phenomena are what the EDI does brilliantly. So I, I won't go into why we're having trouble, because in my question to Fiona, I did raise some problems we're having getting it accepted. And I, I'm not done with that battle, meeting with top civil servants and speaking to a parliamentary committee on health and sport uh, next week. And I'm going to give them a run for their money. And uh, I'm going to see why they don't want to invest in the future of young Scots by finding out where their money would do the most good in preschool. I'm going to use Fiona's slide she used on John Howard. If that could convince John Howard, Fiona, I can convince these Scots. <laughs> Second investment, and I'm going to have to speed up now. I spent a lot of time on the early life one, so you forgive me. But it's also the most important one. It's the one with the most rapid yield, and it's the one with the largest payoff per, per your pound invested. Uh, labor market tax transfer 
such as parental leave policies to lift all parents of young children out of poverty. And this is actually cheap because when I lived in Tanzania, the absolute crude birth rate was 5% per year. So out of every thousand people in the population, there were 50 new babies born a year. So all those kids have to be raised and then sent to school and all the rest of it. Well, Scotland's crude birth rate is closer to 1%. So the burden is one fifth as much per capita simply because of crude birth rates. So Scotland could afford to do this, but it hasn't chosen to do that yet. And I'll show you the, the data. This is child poverty rates in the UK uh, as a whole and in Scotland. Um, you could ignore all of the middle of the graph because it's the regions. And it shows this huge variation across the regions of the UK, England as well as Wales, that is not the whole UK. Uh, and then on the far right is Scotland. And what you see is two points in time. The, the darker, the left purple one for the English data, take the far left pair of bar graphs, is 1996, 78, 98, 99, child poverty rate. Um, and it's, it's sitting up really nearly 40%, right? And then you see on the right, uh, you see for, Sc for Scotland that it's actually, by 2006, 2007, Scotland has dropped. It was lower to start with, but it's dropped even more. So you know what Churchill said. He said there's lies, damn lies, and there's statistics. So that's the problem with child poverty rates when expressed as a relative fraction. So what, what this is is the percentage of kids whose families make less than 60% of the median income. So what's happened is that the top half of the income distribution in the UK has made more money every year until the last few years and done really much better than the poor. The poor not moving anywhere. And in that situation, you get this sort of paradoxical situation where you cannot, you cannot improve the poverty rate very much because it's structurally, structurally set. It could if you improve the incomes of those at the bottom, but that would require a transfer payment. And if you've listened to David Cameron recently, you'll know that he's not going to do that. Uh, so the second problem is that in the last few years, the median income has actually dropped. And that means that it's, it's actually easy. It's easier to hit the target. But as the Roundtree Foundation in the UK said, this is hardly a cause for celebration. You don't want to beat child poverty because the median income is dropped. That's not the right way to do it, for everybody that is. So there are lots of things that could be done, but Scotland actually doesn't have the levers under devolution at the state it's in now. And I'm not expressing an opinion here with respect to the referendum, because I'll probably lose my job if I do that. But uh, the University of Edinburgh is officially neutral. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, uh, it, it's, it, it's, I would say it's pretty hard to change that outcome when you don't control taxation, you don't control social welfare policy, or any other form of transfer, or m even minimum wage, you don't control it. It's all held in, it's so-called reserved for Whitehall. So when you are thinking about the coverage of the referendum, I want you to just realize that for certain kinds of Scots who would like to see action on this sort of issue, they they feel that they have to press for more freedom from Whitehall to do it. Especially the Whitehall in power right now, who, well, let's not get started. Now, I'm switching just for a minute to pensioner poverty because that's the other end of life where we can see whether society is humane. And in terms of health equity, it's just as important, isn't it? Uh, because it's still unbelievable to me that such a large fraction of UK elderly are below the poverty line. So this one has got two graphs before housing, after housing, uh, and you see that it's still sitting up between 13 and 15 percent last year. And um, it's wrong. It's completely wrong. I see, I see people in the Tesco, the grocery store where I go, and it's not, I don't live in a particularly wealthy area, and um, you know, I see them scratching around in their, their wallet to get that extra pound to buy six eggs. They're going to make those six eggs last six days, too, I can tell you. It's, it's shameful. So what happened in Canada? Well, you know this story, eh? Brian Mulroney was on Parliament Hill, and he, he said uh, he saw a great power demonstration in front of him, and he thought he would avoid it, but uh, somebody at the front, I think she's fairly diminutive, very, very powerful woman, though, she came up to him and she said, Brian, he said, if you don't index the pensions, we're going to get you at the polls. 
Now, you may remember that Bob Mulroney was not a liberal in any sense. He, he closed down Shefferville, Quebec. That was his hobby. He closed down whole towns, mining towns. And um, he didn't want to index the pension. But, the, he, you know, they vote. The, the, children of, the children of the poor don't vote. So Brian indexed the pension. And now Canada has one of the lowest rates of elderly poverty in the world. Very similar. This is old data, so it's an old slide. We've got newer data, of course, now. But you know, a lot of my Canadian data is old. Uh, and uh, this is in 91, in Canada's poverty. So this graph's constructed, as many of you know, it's from Kai High. But where the gray bar is the percentage in poverty among the elderly before taxes and transfers, and the green bar is after taxes and transfers. So it shows you this enormous power that taxes and transfers do, like an index pension, to bring down poverty rates to under 5% in Canada. Um, and, you know, there's the UK. At that time, it hadn't brought them down even to 20%. So it only looked good compared to Australia and the US. Sheesh, what kind of comparator is that? You know, lame duck. Uh, so, we could do more. Now, what about record linkage? Right now, we don't have uh, access to, as, as Andrew Morris was explaining, uh, we don't have legally the ability to readily link to HMRC tax data. Uh, and we would need to get that um, and certainly have a much better handle for the elderly, in particular, of other sources of income. And it wouldn't be easy, but it would be a much better way to understand the determinants, for example, of chronic. Uh, chronic institutionalization in the elderly. Because what's going on is that a law has been passed which forces you to spend down the value of your entire estate um, if you surpass a limit. And I think somebody here will tell me what it is. It's something like, is it 50,000 pounds, 75,000 pounds, something like that, 72, whatever it is. And so once you've spent that on your care, then you don't have to spend down the rest of your estate. But that's a very big amount of money for most British people, who many people never owned any property. You've got to bear in mind, this is not North America. Okay, so uh, in order to understand the determinants of chronic institutionalization prematurely, you have to know whether some people are at risk of spending down their capital uh, when they don't have a relative who's going to take them in. And you've got to have a very detailed understanding of their finances as well as their health. So we're working on that. There's a new Scottish longitudinal study of aging that uh, my colleague David Bell at Sterling, a brilliant economist there, has got a pilot funded for, and we're going to try and Set one up using the uh, NHS CHI number, the Scottish CHI number as the sampling frame. Um, now, this is really in Clyde's turf. So, uh, you know, I, I just need you to understand that Scotland is a very good worked example of something that hasn't, hasn't been invested in. Not that Canada has done such a great job uh, on early childhood education. You need, if you want to level the playing field of life, this is a sine qua non. I'll show you how conservative some of the official bodies are in a minute that have pronounced on this in the UK. You have to have universally accessible, that means a pram walk away on a winter day, or as they say in Scotland, when the drich is stoten down. You've got to have a pram walk away, an early child development center with people trained at the bachelor's level and somebody close by with even more education. What we're doing now in the UK is we're paying child care workers anything between 13 and 16,000 pounds a year, and then they pay income tax on that. You know what that take-home pay looks like? You'd have to live with your parents. You couldn't possibly live independently on that, not, not in the city. So, um, you know, no respect. No respect, no training, it's a vicious circle. People from the bottom of the class in high school, they do the child care. Not the right solution. If you want to see the right model, go to Holland. Every neighborhood has a center with a pedagogue with bachelor's level training in early child development. And they know how to mix and match the activities to stimulate all the aspects of the kids' development that need stimulation. And they know that the little kids from deprived homes come in un completely unable to express themselves, their wishes, their needs, cowed by authority, boys acting out, girls withdrawn. That's the price poverty exacts on children by age five. And uh, it can be largely turned around, uh, as Murabuka data from Perth showed, that the great graph that, that Fiona put up. I didn't have to use that graph. Thank you, Fiona. So Scotland has tried. It said it's going to try and get more and more kids into preschool. Um, age three, I think they have a guarantee now of 15 hours a week. They're going to increase that. But, but the quality is the problem. If it's not high quality, it won't do the job. 
So shortly after I got to Scotland, um, there was a very interesting, uh, well, first of all, I just need to show you one, one thing. Many of you have seen me talk with this before. This, this is data that Clyde and Dan Keating put in their book, and it's, it's from uh, a brilliant but little-known Canadian, Doug Wilms, at the University of New Brunswick, who has been the chief analyst of PISA data, which is the program of uh, standardized uh, uh, educational testing, where they take a test, in this case, youth literacy, it's on the y-axis, and they back translate it into all the languages of these countries, make sure it's equivalent. They do the scoring on a, this, as representative a sample as they can get of kids, in this case, 16 to 25 year olds. So they've probably finished most of their formal education that would affect their literacy score. Uh, and uh, what they put on the x-axis is the parents' level of schooling. And all these graphs look the same. Clyde and I always used to refer to them as fan graphs. And what they show is that if you're a little twinkle waiting to jump down from the sky to be born, and you're over a country with those kinds of names, Northern Ireland, New Zealand, Belgium, Ireland, Poland, USA, and Canada's in the middle. The slope is very steep between your parents' attained education level and your score at 16 to 25. Because, well, you, 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 put, you fill in the blank, I'll come back to it. These countries up here, oops, sorry. These countries up here are leveling the playing field of life, and they're doing so in a very particular way. Now, if, if Kate Pickett, who's an old friend and a former student, and, and her partner, Richard Wilkinson, were here who wrote The Spirit Level, they would tell you that it's because the whole society is more equal. They would say, oh, yes, it's just because Sweden and the Netherlands, and oh, they're all just more equal. Everything's more equal. It just permeates. It's like miasma. I don't buy that. I don't think that's helpful. The truth is, these countries have had for decades, this is old data. This is Doug Williams' publication from the mid-'90s. They have had for decades near universal pre-primary education of the sort I described above. So when kids hit primary school, they're way more equal in their ability to learn and function in a group environment. Um, so if you are a twinkle and you're thinking of being jumping down anywhere to be born, you know, you've got to jump into a rich family if you're jumping down out of the celestial plane in this, uh, these countries, but not in these countries up here. So this, of course, uh, is sort of something many Canadians have become dimly aware of over the years. Didn't convince Mulroney when they canned the, the Child uh, Care Act, right? They got that, got that out of the way, first order of business. Uh, not Mulroney. What's that guy in charge now? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's the guy, yeah. But, you know, most, most, most people in education know all this in Canada. Um, not so much in Europe. This, this graph is radical for people in Europe. It's a radical idea that you could change transgenerational transmission of educational attainment, that you could actually change it in some countries much more than others. Um, but when I got to Scotland, a very interesting report was issued by the Scottish Literacy Council, and it, it basically said this. Oh, that, that's just to show you. I said some very conservative bodies were beginning to say that everybody should start school at two, and if they're high risk at one, it may mean preschool care. That is the official school inspection agency of the UK. Those are school inspectors. They're not, they're not the, the radical socialist league. Right? It's just not a radical idea. It's a wonderful thing that they said that. But so far, not a peep out of Whitehall. Not a peep. So this idea, of course, has been widely now publicized, particularly Jim Heckman is going, to do, going around uh, Western countries, he's been in Britain doing talks, and uh, he uses these graphs to, to make the point, you get the biggest bang for your buck uh, by investing in that early period. So you all know all this, but that's not what's happening in the UK. That's not what's happening. The investments are still overwhelmingly going into later, later schooling, and it's got to stop. So, I've implied here that if we had a good record linkage system, it would be able to track all of these things in, at the individual level. And we would understand uh, the contribution of preschool, if there was variation, and I'm afraid there will be for a long time yet, to the later outcomes, including the citizenship outcomes of the sort that were tracked in the Perry uh, uh, High School Ypsilanti project and all the other controlled trials from so long ago. So that's the challenge. And at the present time, we're quite a ways from that, uh, at least in the UK, I would say. Quite a ways from it. I wouldn't say that's true in Canada. I, I've recently, just today, was sent some slides by Nora Lou Roos, 
about the talk she's going to do at our request in Edinburgh for the Far Institute's first big get-together, a few hundred people, and uh, she's going to talk about what Manitoba has been able to do for a long time, and she's going to show them that she's been able to do that for decades. All those kinds of outcomes linked together at the individual level across service sectors. Uh, and I know BC's able to do much of that as well. And I think, you know, other parts of the world, I think Perth, I mean, Western Australia is pretty far along on that. And some of us just have to work harder at it. We've got education on board. They have made all their data anonymously linkable in Scotland. I don't know so much about the rest of the country. I, in England, is it working for you, David, in Wales? Good. So, you know, we're getting there. Okay, so um, I just wanted to make this point about post-school entry. There still is an enormous problem with dropouts. And now they're mostly boys. And they're, they're, they don't always appear as dropouts because they're kept in till the legal age of leaving school, but they're not learning anymore. They're, they're a bigger and bigger problem. And we're beginning to see this flip over of failed adolescent male schooling in all wealthy countries. And you could come up with your own ideas about how schools could be better uh, designed and run to deal with it. But the thing is, you have to set up the right kind of incentives. And there have been programs to pay kids an allowance to stay in school. And in poor settings, they seem to have made a difference. Um, they were re recently withdrawn uh, in England. So I guess you could say we're on the right side of that one. Um, but we have to think a bit more creatively about this. Um, I've said there we're nationally appropriate because, you know, in, in, in rural Tanzania, I'm not, sure I, I'm not sure you want everybody to have secondary school education because there's only one work for 90% of the population, and it's the same work their parents and grandparents and great-grandparents did. And until there's some industry, everybody has to just plant cops or look after animals. That's what there is to do. That's how you make a living. So I think, you know, I'm not, it's not my job to set what the right level of education is for various countries. That's their job. But, um, you know, one size doesn't necessarily fit all in that regard. But in Scotland, we, we need everybody to get beyond secondary, if you like. So after I got to Scotland, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be able to get through the whole talk, so I'm, I'm probably going to end up with just de dealing with the first half of life here. But uh, too many asides. That's my nature. I can't stop myself. Uh, when I got to Scotland, there was a report by the Literacy Council, as I was saying, that basically said that based on that kind of testing, a fifth of Scots, 20% of Scots were functionally innumerate and illiterate. This is a country which had uh, the, one of the first near universal literacy scores in the time around the Jacobite Rebellion, shortly thereafter, there was an enormous move that, led by the Kirk, the Presbyterian Church, to make sure that everybody could read their own Bible, because that was an anti-papal measure, remember? So uh, that really was world class, but somehow 20% of Scots fell out of that wagon, and they've never climbed back on. Um, now, the minister, when confronted with this information, Mike Russell, he's still the minister, his, his uh, response was zero tolerance. Now, what did he mean? What did he mean? He meant, we'll shoot the messenger. Where's the testing done? Schools. Must be their fault. Must be their fault, right? So, fortunately, the Literacy Council was so quick off the mark, they immediately ran and an analysis of variance to see whether the kids' scores on the testing were more related to their postcode of residence and its, in, its uh, Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation score or the school's other characteristics like some sort of overall mean for the school's catchment. And what they found was, while individuals may defy this trend, no school in a deprived area is able to record a similar level of success that is on, on these standardized tests to that achieved by all schools in the most affluent areas. The gaps between schools are far less important than the differences between students. In Scotland, who you are, and they don't mean your genetics, they mean you, who your parents are in terms of social class and the neighborhood you're raised in, is much more important than the school you attend. Now, I understand the schools can make a difference. I'm not a naysayer. I do get it. Schools vary, and some schools are incredibly successful at doing more with kids than others. But when you start as far behind as a kid from a housing estate in Scotland, at five, they're not going to pull you up by your bootstraps. Not going to happen, statistically speaking. Um, so again, you see, in order to understand what's going on as people reach that glass ceiling of no qualifications, that's the term used in the UK for people who don't have full high school, no qualifications. And there's no jobs for those people. 
when I, where I grew up, in a village of 2,000 outside of London, Ontario, those guys, great hulking guys who were kept in until grade eight, until they turned 16, they pumped gas for the next 25 or 30 years. There's nobody pumping gas there now. There's no jobs like that. In the winter, they shovel snow. But there's no jobs for people who have only a strong back in modern economies. They're, they're vanishing. Uh, so we have to take this very seriously. and We have to think hard about how we would deal with that 20%. And if you're not sure whether it's 20% in your society, see if there's somebody run the EDI on it. Because the EDI will predict really well, and Sally Brinkman and Fiona and others have shown this recently in Australia, it really, really tightly predicts later school success and therefore your life course chances of making any money and rising very far in any kind of work. So I'll just finish with this one because uh, I think I'd be rather leaving a little bit of time for discussion and I've, I've, I'm keeping you. Um, some people think that people like Clyde and I and others in this room who've championed population health and worked with public health, we're, we've got some sort of a thing against medical care in a clinical sense. No, no, no. I, I, I have publicly debated people who in Canada is, is a member of the sort of socialist rump physicians group in the medical reform group of, uh, uh, for many years. People who thought, as one famous dean of medicine at the University of Toronto said, healthcare should be just like hamburgers. Should be bought and sold just like hamburgers. He was a bit of a hamburger, that guy. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that Canadians are often put on the back foot, as they say. They're back footed by arguments like, well, you know, anything in the public sector is less efficient. Or, well, you've got to have a market. Now, we know that in the UK, the confusion is so rife that the former Minister of State for Health, Andrew Lansley, whose entire training in health policy comes from the members of the golf club that his wife, a GP, took him to meet. That's his entire training. And he got all these ideas from that kind of source, and a fair bit from KPMG, and Pete Marwick, they were in there. So, you know, and he's brought marketization again to the NHS, and it's wrecking havoc. It's a disaster. And my, my good colleague and friend, Alison Pollock, fights that fight in, in, the, in the BMJ and the Lancet every few weeks and writes about what a travesty it all is. And I think she's gradually winning hearts and minds, but boy, it's slow work. So is there a study that helps us make the case that free medical care really can bring down health inequalities? measured health inequalities. Yes, and it actually comes from uh, Canadians, and it's a study that uh, Doug Manuel and others published in the JECH in 2007, and uh, some of you trained by Doug, I know you'll know this, this study, Laura. So what they did was they did a very simple thing. They partitioned the deaths in Canada for this 25-year period after Medicare was fully implemented beyond the hospital level. I think pretty well all provinces were paying for ambulatory care as well. That's important because of access issues. Right. And they subdivided the deaths into three categories by cause. Those very well known t thing to, to put the deaths amenable to medical care as it was practiced then. But a little novel thing they did was that if we knew how to prevent the disease but we didn't know how to cure it, they put it in a second category, amenable to public health measures. And what they mean is idealized public health measures, meaning we could have stopped lung cancer if we could have got people to stop smoking. At that time, we weren't putting in place very strong measures. Taxes, marketing controls, that wasn't happening yet. Remember, big, big scare on the border, cigarettes coming over the border. You know, later we found out who was, who was taking those cigarettes across the border and giving them to the native people. Well, big, big tobacco. They had little outfits along the border making those cigarettes. Anyway, on that right upper side are things which are now medically treatable like HIV but weren't in this 25 year period. There, were no, there was no antiretrovirals, okay? So, and the, on the bottom right is ischemic heart disease, which is sort of half and half. Most of the studies suggest about half of the reduction in, it, in, it, in its death rate has been due to better care and half due to better risk factors at the level of whole population. So what they did was they then did age standardized years of life loss according to the postcode um, deprivation quintile. So this is the absolute difference on the left is for causes due to amenable to medical care, the absolute difference between the top and bottom quintile by a postcode of address, uh, a basket of measures of social status. And what you see is this amazing decline in both men in the black dots and women in the round circles. In the 25-year period for causes due to medical care, 
not reflected in the other causes to the same degree. And although the authors did try to do this analysis for the United States, and I think that would be interesting, my understanding is that, is that such inequalities in general have not shifted markedly in the United States. And I, I'd like somebody to do that study. So I trot this out because I think it's important to be able to say that free medical care does matter, and it matters particularly as you get on in life, because a lot of stuff suddenly hits you. You didn't get a chance at prevention. Suddenly, you've got something bad. And to give the centers in Canada a real credit, they have done, I think, the best work in the world at showing whether health care investments are equitable. Manitoba, Chesper have been doing papers on whether the allocation of health care resources paid for by the public purse in Canada relatively reflects the need according to social economic variables in the population. And as you may know, typically it does, meet, it does generally reflect the need, certainly for most ambulatory care uh, at the primary care level and hospitalization, a bit less so for, for referral care. And those are things we still have to work on. So I was going to talk a bit about later life, but I think what I want to end with is I want to end with this idea that investments for health equity uh, are not rocket science. We can identify these broad classes of investment, but in order to monitor whether they're achieving their goals, we, we need far better data capture systems that are not based upon body counts in the cemetery or uh, people you know, coming into hospital beds. Those are too late, too little. Uh, they're not sensitive enough in a modern era. We need to understand functional uh, aspects of the population. And surveys can help, cohorts can help, but we could do a lot better job with record linkage. And I dedicate uh, this talk to Clyde and to all of you out there working hard to achieve that goal.